imagine that you could grow all the food necessary using trees and not to disturb the soil. So you plant the trees once, they grow like for hundreds of years, some species do, and they provide you with constant uh, source of food. Hello, welcome back to the Ramsey United channel. I'm Jonathan Ramsey and I'm here in Gapinin, Poland with Łukasz Nowatski. Hello everyone. Today we're gonna be talking about permaculture, something that I've been very, very interested in recently, watching a lot of YouTube videos, and I thought it would be cool to come out to some place that actually is really doing permaculture here in Poland, because uh, I, I think it's not that popular yet, but do you think it's gonna get more popular? It is getting more popular, so more and more people are uh, trying to get to know what permaculture is and try to do something with it. So it's getting popular. Right, and we're in Gapinin, Poland, which is just on the border of the Łódź and Mazowian regions. And the Łódź region is one of the driest, if not the driest regions in Poland, right? Yeah, in central Poland, it is the driest region. Uh, yeah, so we've got huge problems with uh, uh, water and lack of water. And we, in, like two years ago, we had like five months without any rain so uh, as you can see the soil is really sandy it doesn't have a lot of um, organic material in it so it's pretty hard to grow something without water if you have such a, a sandy soil so right and we just had a month where there was no rain whatsoever right there was no rain and suddenly the winter came back we we've got uh, heavy snowfall like a mm, couple of days ago we had like uh, 50 centimeters of snow. Uh, there are some uh, broken branches on the trees because it was so heavy that they couldn't, uh, you know, hold it. So yeah, this is how weird the climatic uh, conditions are going to to get. Why this place? Why 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 did you did you buy this land specifically to do permaculture, or is this something from your family? No, I I uh, bought it uh, specifically to do some permaculture experiments here and tests and um, try to figure out is uh, permaculture really the answer for the future. What was the land being used for before you got it? It was used for grazing uh, dairy cows and some sheep and it was like free range grazing and it was so intensive that uh, the animals you know, literally destroyed the place. So we've got a lot of sand in here. This is like, you know, you can make a beach out of it. So we tried to uh, figure out how in those soil, poor soil conditions, how you can establish a food forest using permaculture techniques and how you can grow vegetables using uh, local materials to produce compost and to make this sand into, you know, arable soil. So this is the challenge. Today is April the 7th, 2022, and we're, before the growing season, right? And so the idea of doing this project was that, the idea here is that we're gonna come back here maybe in a couple months and see how it's all going. I'm just curious to see what a permaculture farm looks like over time. And cause right now you look at it and like, it doesn't look like anything too exciting is happening here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Boring stuff. Ordinary uh... people look at this and they say like, what is, you know, there's what nothing is here. This? There's yeah. nothing here. It's like, tell me what we're looking at here. This is like desert, right? It's, uh, when you look uh, under the microscope on the shape of those uh, sand grains, they are very round and uh, like, you know, polished. They don't have any cavities. And when any kind of organisms try to stuck on it, they just can't. They are uh, washed away with water and all the nutrients is washed away with water. Uh, so it's pretty hard to establish a soil organism, microorganism population. So uh, we use compost. We just spread the compost at the top. As you can see, uh, we had some uh, very nice, good quality compost we uh, make ourselves here. 
uh, using all the uh, materials that you can gather from from this place local and convert it into compost so these are like um, fallen leaves from the trees these are uh, grass clippings these are uh, branches made into wood chips and uh, some animal manure like uh, from our chickens and and uh, the best way to compost it and and the fastest way is to use this berkeley method that uh, you can get uh, ready-made compost after 20 days but this is dark compost so as you get uh, much sun uh, it dries out quickly very fast so as you can see at the top layer you it's almost dry but when you dig deeper it's quite moist and and what are you going to yeah. grow here this year uh, another uh, patch of vegetables different vegetables we've got kale cabbage onions and tomatoes uh, a little bit of corn sweet corn uh, some uh, sunflowers as you can see and uh, this part was um, covered with mulch and we used this technique that you probably know uh, if you are into permaculture it's the roof stout method uh, using only hay to protect the soil to cover it with with this hay mulch and under, underneath the hay you put some seed potatoes and they grow very nice so we collected a bunch of you know bags of very nice potatoes to keep it for the winter to store it so the plan for this season is to make uh, another part of it I started to buy the land in 2013 but I didn't had uh, you know a lot of money so I had to make some uh, you know steps and uh, gather all the necessary budget for it so it was like making the place larger uh, during the it's like eight nine nine years yeah the lady that sold this property to me, she asked uh, what is my plan for it. So I told her that I will grow vegetables here. And she laughed at me at, at first. She thought, what? In this sandy soil, it is impossible. And I thought, okay, maybe it is, but I will try to do my best and we will see in a couple of months or years. So now she's, you know, uh, visiting me from time to time and she's like oh this is interesting what are you doing here so can you tell me a bit about it because maybe i will do it in my garden so she's now uh she was skeptical at first but she's now getting uh, you know more open to the idea that you can do it differently and uh, with a success and uh, when i tell her that you know we don't have a tractor we don't need to buy uh, oil to put into uh, this heavy machine and we do all the work uh, with hand tools and biological tools uh, like compost and um, compost teas and other stuff like that and she sees the um, outcomes the effects of this she's starting to believe that this is possible this is another alternative way of doing farming so yeah, this is quite uh, optimistic as well because uh, people who are into farming for like uh, whole their lives, they are really like, I do all the things the best. So you will not tell me what to do, right? You are from the city, you don't know anything and you come up to the country and you will tell me what to do on my farm. No, no, no. Capitalism is not sustainable, so it's uh, the the idea of uh, constant growth is is well the only example coming from nature of this kind of models are cancer cells. They are growing and not stopping until they kill the host, right? So this is an anal analogy for me. So if we are trying to uh, make an economic uh, system, a worldview based on constant growth, we are cancer of, of this earth. And we don't know, and we don't have another place to go, right? So I think the better way is to focus on not killing the host at the moment. So uh, yeah, this is, this is the, uh, the baseline. 
and uh, most of, of the society doesn't seem to get it. Of course I do myself, uh, do see myself as a climate activist because I try to foresee some things, right? I try to gather data from, from different sources that I can and I try to be prepared Okay, I don't know if, uh, if I can be totally prepare, prepared for the ice age uh, or even the climate warming, warm up, but maybe I can do some stuff that will help me to deal with those kind of changes that may, may be present or may not. So I'm open. I read a lot of uh, sci-fi uh, books like um, Colonizing Mars, and going into space and this was like uh, you know a powerful uh, impact for my imagination and uh, i thought that maybe i would like to be an astronaut uh, someday but it was kind of unreal for me you know uh yeah normal guy from poland um you know you you gotta dream big but uh you gotta be also realistic so it's not uh possibility for me to go into space, I guess. I don't know, but I guess it's not. Right. So I thought that, okay, I maybe will not go to space, uh, but what can I do to make something here on Earth? So this was the first like question that powered my imagination and all the books, uh, you know, sci-fi books. And uh, so I didn't have, uh, you know, any piece of land to, to work with it. I lived in a block of flats um, at the ground level, uh, so the first place that I could use for uh, doing some permaculture experiments was my balcony so and basement. So this was the starting point. So did your parents think it was weird when you decided that you want to have a be a farmer, basically? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that they were quite concerned that their son wants to be a farmer in the future because it's a hard uh, job to be a farmer, right? So when I was, you know, um, researching how, how the farming is done, like for more than a couple hundred of years, it's always seemed to me that this is a huge mistake um, and it's connected to you know, the destruction of the environment, that you need to uh, tear off everything that grows before you even start growing food. And you need to cut down all the trees, uh, plow the soil, uh, put some synthetic fertilizers and other chemical stuff to make things grow. So this was like crazy idea for me. And on the other hand, I saw this beautiful piece of land that you, you know, you leave it just like that and in, it will grow, you know, huge stuff. It will grow marvelous trees. It will uh, support uh, different communities of animals, wild animals. It will support all the processes that are necessary to uh, recycle nutrients and to purify water. And you, you just want to, you know, sit and observe and you can learn from it quite a lot. So if you suddenly cut off all the uh, gas streams, all the food supplies coming from Russia and from East, the Ukraine was uh, a huge supplier of grains and other, other food sources. So are we self-sufficient in terms of food production in Poland? I guess not. And is Europe self-sufficient in terms of food production? Definitely not. So we will need to figure out some ways to make up with the demands. So this will be very interesting uh, way to, to deal with this whole, uh, you know, war, environment stuff, climatic changes. And this is very hard to, uh, you know, connect. Do you hope that more average citizens are gonna start taking this more seriously and start thinking about how to grow their own food? If they will go to, to the nearest store and they will see the same pictures that we had during pandemic, the empty shelves, uh, you know, the fuel prices skyrocketing, 
when it's almost double the price before the, the war time. Uh, they will be, you know, made to do this. So even though they maybe don't want to go into agriculture, uh, this, uh, I think this will be a necessity for, for them to survive. So we are stepping, you know, from this uh, higher point uh, of the land. We are stepping into the lowest flat zone next to the Pilica River. So this is the lowest part of the uh, farm. And as you can see, it's quite diverse. Uh, some green stuff is uh, waking up after winter time. What did you study? Environment protection. Yeah. Okay. And you uh, did that? My specialty was eco-hydrology and ecosystemic biotechnology. So I did that because I wanted to know how the environment works. So um, I tried to get uh, as much uh, interesting tools to get to know the environment better. So I thought that uh, environment protection could be a uh, starting and point. Which school was that? Uh, University of Łódź. Everything that is in surplus, we try to sell it. And um, then, you know, provide with some money for us. Uh, but it's... Uh, I also do some, you know, permaculture teaching and uh, design works. Uh, so it's not only like, you know, living uh, off the ground and uh, from the land and just selling the produce that you uh, grow in the uh, at the farm do, do you know but it's if you if you ask about my source of income it's pretty diversified so it's another example of how to use permaculture to your economics so yeah right but do you know anybody in poland who is able to do permaculture and you do only, only the only income is from farming uh, I guess not, not yet, because this is in Poland. It's a quite fresh topic. So every Why do you think that is? every farm I know is at the starting point, right. at, at the you know uh, low, low level of uh, biodiversity, and they are growing up to the task. So uh, I think not yet. Right. But we were talking earlier about how Poland is having big drought problems. Yeah. And there are these challenges and, and, you know, it seems to be getting worse and worse with climate change. So why hasn't permaculture become more popular in Poland? What is stopping permaculture from becoming the next big trend? What's the problem? I think that, uh, you know, when you look around the Poland and uh, go visit places that are saying they are designed along the permaculture rules and directives and you see the people that uh, live there uh, you get this feeling that these are mostly hippies and people that will uh, you know try to escape from the society and try to live uh, totally alternative ways and they don't want to uh, like you know melt into the society with, with their knowledge, skills and so on. So maybe this is a kind of barrier for people that are living in the cities and would also like to grow things on their own. But it is very hard to get, uh, you know, all the necessary information how to do it, to start. So I think that this was uh, the main reason that permaculture uh, took very slowly uh, here in Poland. So, so like as a permaculture farmer, like how do you define success and like what's like the next thing for me, for you? What's your goal? Well, yeah, we try to uh, buy a little bit more land because we aim to be a farm that is uh, like uh, 15 hectares in total. So uh, we have a couple of hectares to buy still uh, in the future. But the, the main uh, goal for us or the, you know this uh, point that I can feel that we were really successful is when you are turning this into the black stuff underneath the mulch so this is uh, this is a success for me because this 
uh, this is my future investment, right? So if I will make uh, more places that have these sandy soils around my farm and turn into this black beauty covered with mulch, uh, I know that I will feed my family and I can produce enough surplus to sell to my local community and uh, to earn some money to in reinvest in the development of the farm. So it will keep on going uh, using mostly sunlight, right? So it's like uh, creating some conditions to make uh, really, really good use uh, of the sunlight that is given to us and to convert it into money and food and other stuff that you that will make your life easier. So mm. this is the goal actually. So mm. it's like you don't want to be based on fossil fuels. You try to get as much as possible based on solar energy. Do you feel in some way like you are like a doomsday prepper or something? Well, n not a prepper, but well, in some way, maybe yes, because uh, I try to make things that will keep me going, even if, uh, you know, we will enter into shortages of food and fuel. So I try to, you know, make things uh, more sustainable. But uh, just look around. Uh, if, if you hear all that, you know, uh, news, noise and uh, pessimistic stuff that come up from TV or, or the radio or the Internet, and you you keep it you know on the on the right side of your of your brain uh, and then you come here and you see those trees that are these are quite stable trees right they will grow here like for hundreds of years and this is something that you well if you if you know how to work with this ecosystem how to connect to to the energy that flows through this ecosystem then you have this other, you know, reality, because this is a reality. Uh, it's not a fantasy. It's not something that can be made up in some twisted mind of like Putin or someone else. Uh, this is reality. This is something that is the closest thing to you. So this gives me quite, you know, peaceful thoughts. I can be quite optimistic about the future knowing that this ecosystem will go for very, very long time. Even though if I may be gone and, uh, you know, other people, uh, but this, this will keep on going. So, yeah, it's quite optimistic, right? So this is uh, the hay that we collect. And uh, as you can see, it's really moist. So it keeps the soil cool. Uh, it protects it from the uh, sun. Uh, when you pick up a piece of uh, compost and uh, you know put it directly to the sunlight, uh, you get uh, UV rays that will kill all the microbes in it. So you want to prevent it uh, by using some kind of co cover. So you can use wood chips, you can use hay mulch, you can use uh, other stuff to protect the soil. And you just mimic what nature says uh, and does because every fall you get uh, leaves coming from the trees, covering the ground and protecting all the microbes. So we do the same and underneath it, you got this black, very moist, beautiful soil. So this is quite fast uh, way to make a desert into production in terms of growing food. So we are now entering the food forest, uh, which is a very young food forest. Uh, most of the trees, food, you know, that fruit trees and uh, bushes were planted like uh, five or six years ago. So uh, it's very young ecosystem. These are our rice beds. Uh, we used to grow uh, also vegetables around here. Uh, and now we are uh, shifting uh, this place towards an alley cropping system. So, uh, as you can see, this um, rice bed in the middle is uh, planted with some uh, elder bushes. 
These are young seedlings planted this year, so very tiny, uh, cut to almost the ground to uh, promote the growth. And it's uh, mulched with uh, wood chips and uh, this will keep the soil moist around the, uh, the base of the bush. Uh, this is the place where we do the compost, the Berkeley method. Okay, so this is the first very tiny flock of hens. The soil around here is uh, quite sandy too, but we have the chickens around uh, for like uh, 10 months uh, at the place, so not too long, but as you can see, there is a lot of leaf litter around the, the place. So they scratch it, shred it, poop into it, uh, inoculate with microorganisms and the sandy soil and the mulch that is naturally created by the trees uh, is turning into this beautiful black soil which is like you know the perfect uh, substrate to grow anything you want which it looked like sand before and now 10 months yeah. later it's already changed so this looked like this uh -huh. 10 months ago when the uh, summer is progressing, we will use uh, electric netting to create zones that they can focus on and not to dis disturb other places around the farm that we will uh, have some uh, production in. So uh, we will manage their movement around the farm. There is another hen, mother hen, that uh, at the second day of April, she sat on, on first eggs. So we will not try to disturb her much. We've got three nest boxes. You can see uh, fresh eggs. These are uh, laid by the hens today. So we've got five uh, fresh eggs from today. And she's sitting maybe on 10, 11 eggs. Uh, so we wait like around 28 days, maybe 30 days, until the chicks will hatch from the eggs. Very cool. And what about these ones? What... Uh, this is uh, nitrogen fixing trees. Uh, this is a honey locust. And it's not invasive as the black locust is in our part of the world. Uh, you probably know black, black locust and honey locust from North America. Uh, so uh, this is the tree that uh, fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere and releases it uh, through the roots. So we put those trees next to our fruit trees. So we got constant supply of nitrogen. So we don't need to use any chemical fertilizers to support the growth of the trees with nitrogen. This is like natural stuff from the atmosphere for free. Oh, bigger one. So why do you keep them separate? Uh, because the, ro the roosters, they are very territorial. So they will fight when they are too close to each other. You cannot keep uh, two grown-up roosters together because they will like, you know, kill each other. Okay. So uh, each one needs to have their own flock. Right. We've got this uh, bigger uh, chicken run and this what you can see here is like compost pr produced by the chickens uh, during the winter time. So today I will collect some of it, uh, make a pile outside of the pen to heat it up, to speed up the process of, you know, uh, growing some good quality microbes in it. And then I will transfer the good quality compost to the garden beds and start a new uh, season with it. Chickens are happy because they get access to every kind of food, diverse food that they can find uh, in the food forest. When we've got some unused uh, fruit fallen from the trees, they will also process it, giving us eggs every day 
as you can see here. At, at the end you've got like a dozen of eggs. Mm -hmm. And during the night, as you can see, there is a lot of chicken poop laying around, so I need to scrape it because uh, we are at the end of another week. So I change the bedding once a week, giving them fresh bedding to, to start the composting process. And it will, uh, it will keep the smell, uh, you know, at the low level, so you won't feel anything. So permaculture people are not interested in veganism. Some are, but uh, I have some other, uh, you know, insights on on this topic because if you if permaculture is about to. Mm, making some, taking some ideas from the natural ecosystem, name a, an ecosystem that grows without animals. I don't know any that, you know, is just the plants. So I think that you, if you want to keep all the processes really dynamic and good for the soil and you want to suck all the this excessive uh, you know co2 from the atmosphere and other uh, climate uh, uh, other greenhouse gases so you need to work with the whole structure of the ecosystems uh, so you don't want to exclude animals you want to include them and you want to create very dynamic uh, mosaic of processes with you know, with the help of your of your animals. So right. And, but when they get older, do you kill them yourself, or do you do you bring them to a slaughterhouse or something? Or how does that work? No, I try to do it myself uh, here because it's uh, way m less stress for the animal. Yes. Okay. There is no chemistry here, like you know, uh, hormones, antibiotics, and things like that. Just uh, things that they will eat from the food forest and uh, all the bags and uh, you know weed seeds things like that and uh, at the moment we feel that this ecosystem is mature enough to uh, keep up with the chickens but this year we will try to introduce some other animals like goats sheep this year uh, this year yes so this is the goal of this year to introduce more animals because what we saw during the previous season is that they skyrocket the dynamics with, of the soil. So they are really good helpers uh, to, you know, redesign all the structure of uh, microorganisms that live in the soil. And uh, they do it much better than we can. So why not to get into, you know, cooperation with the animals? But if you want to be, you know, a vegan permaculturist uh, and you don't want to keep uh, farm animals, you get into those techniques that will promote or um, make more biodiversity with wild animals. So you will try to attract the wild animals to your place to do exactly the same work as the farm animals do. So this is, I think this is the best way to, to, you know, deal with veganism and uh, all the ethics and uh, not to kill your animals. Yeah. So there is always a way to make some compromises and uh, figure out how to do it. Most of the trees that are growing here, these are like local uh, trees, uh, mostly poplars. Uh, aspen, uh, pines, and uh, what I put in here, um, I just add to this existing ecosystem other stuff, other plants that will produce some food for me. So we've got uh, hazelnuts uh, planted around here. This whole uh, place is planted with hazelnuts, different varieties, and uh, here we've got some uh, apple trees. This is a row of apple trees uh, curving uh, around this, you know, natural contour of the, the, the land. So this is an apple tree. This is an apple tree. Here is another one and another one and another one. 
and this is all fertilized with uh, compost made by the chickens so you get this the location of place where you get production of compost is as close as possible to the location when you want to use the compost and to amend the soil with it. This is a, a very young mulberry seedling so it will fill the gap because you get quite a lot of sun here uh, it will fill the gap and un underneath uh, you get uh, gooseberries this is one gooseberry another one and another one so we've got three gooseberry bushes and some uh, and some strawberries that will fill all the space in between the apple trees we are planting some nitrogen fixers this is a young seedling of karagana uh, it's a pea, uh, pea shrub siberian pea yeah i guess this is the name in english so a uh, nitrogen fixer which will help to support the growth of the apple trees these apple trees are the old varieties so these are like the apples that uh, come to your mind from your childhood the best ones that you remember was like so juicy and tasty so this is a plum tree as you can see very nice very strong seedling here is another one so the spacing between is also you know designed to fit as many trees as possible but to give them as many space as they need to flourish and to grow using the sunlight so we've got another uh, rice bed under the huge oak tree this is wild garlic oh. it's a perennial that will uh, spring back in the in the beginning of the season so now it is like very tiny but it will uh, get bigger and as you can see we've got some uh, fresh growth of different herbs that are just starting to uh, come up from the soil mm. and around the um, uh, perimeter of this uh, bed we were growing shiitake mushrooms as well so we've got uh, different uh, areas of production we've got some perennial herbs we've got some annual herbs and we've got some very um, tasty mushrooms growing in the, in the same location so this is diversified food system we've got like uh, things that are produced on the trees so the higher level of the food forest we've got uh, fruit bushes the lower level we've got ground covers like strawberries We've got um, herbs also covering the ground and uh, when you have this uh, dead organic matter like these branches, as you can see, these are, uh, you know, absolutely priceless uh, medicinal uh, fungi and you can also grow in the same manner other uh, useful fungi, edible ones and uh, everything is in you know this correlation in one place one location but it is stratified it is a very complex system to grow food so this is a totally different situation uh, compared to monoculture flat grain field for example right when you've got just one um, one plant growing on a huge scale uh mining the soil so we are growing uh, our food very diverse food we've got herbs um, fruit uh, fruits and uh, uh, fungi and every kind of uh, organic matter that is produced along the way will support the regeneration of the soil so we are growing uh, food and we are regenerating soils along the way since you know uh, we entered the EU, there were no subsidies uh, targeted to people like me growing food like this. Yeah, and that needs to change. That needs to change, definitely. Yeah, because this is the, the only way we can survive, I guess. Uh, because uh, if you calculate all the costs of fossil fuels at the moment, if you calculate all the costs of uh, chemical fertilizers, 
and all the chemical sprays that uh, normal uh, agriculture is using to produce food, this is like crazy time. It will not, uh, you know, keep up with, with the uh, food demand. So we are entering a very dangerous period of time that the food shortages can be real thing. But is permaculture able to meet that demand that the massive, you know, mainstream agriculture is meeting now? Uh, we are trying to figure it out. So this, uh, this site is, uh, as I said, a demonstration site uh, where we do a lot of experiments, uh, first on the small scale and then putting it to a larger scale to produce enough food to feed other people, not just us, right? So I think the permaculture is uh, very uh, compatible with the uh, local food sovereignty and uh, it can keep up with the local food demand. I don't know yet if it will keep up with the, you know, uh, larger scale demand, uh, but we will see. Maybe there is some kind of fusion of permaculture techniques and traditional um, agricultural lar large scale techniques that can uh, give you the same results with the soil regeneration and uh, give you enough food to uh, make it possible to get rid of the chemistry and things like that. If somebody said like, how do I get started? How do I do this? I mean, what, what, how do you even begin on this type of path? Well, uh, for me, the starting point is to get to, you, you need to really get to know your local resources that you can stand on and establish some production models. And then, well, simultaneously, you need to check out what the local market is, uh, what is its demand, uh, what are the people living around your place are willing to buy from you and um, you just direct your production towards the client. So yeah, this is a huge task for, uh, for just one family to do, because you, as, you, as you mentioned, you, you need to establish a website, you need to uh, be in a constant uh, contact with your clients, you need to uh, manage uh, all the orderings coming to your farm, and then uh, concentrate also your energy to, you know, uh, the, the production level of the of the farm. A cherry tree, very young. Uh, another cherry tree, and here is a pear tree. So, if you walk through this ecosystem, you will not actually see that there is a food forest here, right? It's it looks like normal forest uh, at the at the first sight, but if you look closer and you know what to look for, you will start to see all the different elements that will provide you with, with some uh, food. So uh, we are still at the you know, first step of uh, creating this food forest. So it will keep on going for a couple of years. But in some time, uh, you just, you know, you just plant the trees once and uh, when the time progresses, uh, it will feed you with more fruit than you can uh, eat. So you will produce some surplus. Why are you planting these trees just now? Uh, first of all, we, we didn't know exactly how to plant the trees with, uh, with this kind of soil. So we did plant some, uh, some trees, but they didn't make it and uh, we needed to learn how to make the soil suitable for, uh, for the trees. And uh, you know the term uh, mycorrhizal fungi? So we discovered mycorrhizal fungi, we, which are the key to plant, uh, plant a tree even if the, uh, the soil is plowed and you have no mycorrhizal fungi in the soil present. So you can use mycorrhizal fungi inoculum to support the growth of young trees. And this, uh, this was the secret element that was lacking and we didn't have any success with, with the first uh, uh, planting of fruit trees. That is why we need to, you know, 
learn how to do it with this um, context of this ecosystem. Some lessons are pretty hard when you invest a lot of uh, work and a lot of money sometime to, to make something and it will fail, right? But these lessons are very crucial to progress. So as you mentioned, you, you just learn along uh, the way and you try different things and try to uh, make up a mosaic of techniques that you can use and are really good for uh, your local environment. This is the place where one of the foxes is living. Oh. So he's quite close to, to the place where we keep our chickens. Oh. So how do you protect the chickens from them? Uh, well, we keep them uh, during mm. the night, we keep them closed. Yeah. So this is the only protection yeah. with netting. But he never came over there and tried uh, to get he, them? He came and he succeeded to capture one of our hands. Oh no. But uh, it never repeated. So let's keep up this way. When we checked what was the prehistoric uh, process going on, it was a huge ice block moving through the valley and uh, some material you know pushed uh, in front of the ice was uh, thrown to the sides and this is built during the ice age uh, by the ice you know moving around this place so this is why it is higher and uh, when I was a uh, child, uh, this forest looked differently. It was covered with uh, mostly deciduous trees, not the, not the conifers. And it was cut down when I was at the age of five. And uh, it was good quality wood, so it was priceless. And uh, they took it all off and they planted uh, pine trees, monoculture. As you mm. can see, mostly pine trees. So if you look closer, we've planted like a couple hundred young seedlings of the varieties of trees that were grown here previously. So we've got like uh, hazel, uh, we've got different um, deciduous trees that will grow underneath the pine trees and then we will cut the monoculture and create this very diverse forest that was previously here. So we are trying to uh, get back to what was here um, before this monoculture. And uh, of course it will take quite a lot of time. We planted those trees in, uh, in uh, uh, previous uh, season. So, and they, you know, they are uh, waking up after winter, so I think most of them will grow very nice. Tell me, did you ever have a time when you thought like, okay, I had enough of this permaculture thing and I'm gonna quit? Yes, of course, many times, yeah. Especially when, uh, when you do something that, uh, you know, needs a huge uh, time, work and cost you a lot and someone comes here and destroys it. Like, uh, we've got this couple of guys that uh, like, like to ride their uh, bikes around here, uh, motorbikes. So as you can see, uh, I need to create this barrier to stop them from uh, driving here because I planted some trees uh, around this area. And uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, one example of, of such a thing that uh, you plant, you uh, care about the trees and someone just drives through and destroys everything. What kind of person do you need to be to do this kind of work? I don't know if there is a you know, special characteristic that you, you need to have to, to do the permaculture. I think you need to be open-minded and you need to be willing to shift your ideas from... You, you don't want to be fixed on one idea only right? Because when something goes wrong and you are fixed on one idea, it is very hard to come up with another one uh, to deal with the change. So you, you, well, I think that the only constant thing is the change, right? So you got to be prepared to uh, 
to change yourself, to accommodate to new conditions and to think of other ways to that can support you. And I think that you know creating a very diverse ecosystem uh, around the farm as well as a diverse ecosystem of your income, for example, gives you this stable ground that you can really stand on. So um, maybe maybe you need to be, you know, you know um, inventive. Two years ago when we had this huge drought, uh, I thought, oh my God, how are we going to collect all the necessary water? And very early in the morning, I came out, out of the tent we saw and the, this whole valley was covered with mist and i thought this is it so i went into you know uh, to search uh, through the internet are there ways of collecting water from the mist and of course they are so we made some simple models and uh, they uh, gave us quite good results so it is feasible to establish a larger um, technique to collect the water from the fog, from the mist, and to use it because we are at the higher level, right? So if you collect uh, water from air here, you can deliver it to any point of the farm using just gravity. No fossil fuel, no pump, no anything. So this is the idea that we came up uh, with during the drought season that was like this huge red light shining, right? Uh, because this can happen again, right? So you need to be prepared for it. Be resilient. Is be the resilient, word. yes. How do you take the subject and make it interesting for people who are not interested in gardening? Like, how do you, you have to, it, it, the, 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 that's why I'm kind of oh, asking wait, wait, wait. you. Wait, you got something going on? Okay? I think so. Maybe they just We're missed you. Searching for the chickens. Because huh? we had a predatory bird flying around and he oh. was like trying to catch one of those. Ah. So, you're trying so to count they them? are alarming as you yeah. can see here. And there is one missing, I don't see her. I don't know where she is. Okay. These are okay. okay. One, one is missing. Okay. One r red one. <laughs> no, the black one. The black one is missing. And I can't see her. Uh -huh. Where was it? She was sitting under the uh, straw. Ah, so nobody got hurt. Yeah. It would be a sad way to end. To end the story, yeah. <laughs> and you don't have uh, the ability to stretch time. So you can do as much as you can do just in one day and uh, then you can move on, so. And you think this is the place you want to be for the rest of your life? Yeah, definitely. There is so much to do here uh, to, you, you know, to keep my mind occupied and uh, happy with the results so and uh, I want to see this place like in 15 years from now on to see what it will be like uh, when the all the plants that we are planting now will be much bigger and they will produce uh, so much more than than at the moment so this is uh, this is something that very interests me and uh, yeah this is something uh, worth doing it so we are now uh, leaving the food forest and entering the, uh, the area of our farm where we want to mimic this process as well. So this year we will have animals over here starting to build up uh, all the necessary elements so we can uh, make a huge impact on this quite large piece of land. So this is the place, it's uh, higher in elevation, so it's uh, pretty dry. And as you can see, another place that we have uh, just the sand 
and those small grasses that try to establish themselves. But what we did, we collected a lot of um, local uh, seeds from local varieties of grasses. We put it into those, um, there is a, this technique called uh, seed balls. You know, you uh, take uh, some clay, some compost, mix it together, add some water and uh, seeds. You make those pellets uh, round and you just, you know, throw it on the ground and you leave it like that. And when it rains, the clay and uh, compost collect a little bit of water and the seeds, even though they are put on top of the ex existing sand, they will sprout out and this is what we've done at the huge scale around this place. So let me take you over there. So this was sand before and now it's like... Yes, this was sand before and uh, as you can see, we've got grasses. You can still collect some seeds out of it. And as you can see, this uh, whole ground is covered with thick mulch and there is quite a lot of moisture here. You see, this is a fresh growth and as we try to tear it apart, it's very hard to, to tear it. So it's very resistant to uh, soil erosion and uh, now we need some more support to uh, speed up the process of soil regeneration. So this is the best time to uh, have animals uh, coming here and work with us with this holistic uh, mob grazing uh, scheme to, to make faster changes in the ecosystem. And that's why you want the pigs? That's why I want the pigs, I want uh, sheep, I want goats, I want cow. Uh, so we can really speed up the process. And in the meantime, what we are doing as well we establish a, a silvopasture system. Suddenly we are running out of battery, but we had an awesome time. Yes, definitely. And I, I'm gonna come back in a couple months and there's gonna be animals here. I hope so, yeah. And we're gonna see how it looks on a Polish permaculture farm when the growing season is happening. Because I, 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 I wanna show the evolution of it all. So thank you very much, Wukasz. Thank you for for, Thank for, you. for, for your, your generosity. I had a really good time and we'll, uh, we'll keep in touch. Definitely. Thank you very much, Jonathan, to visit us and uh, stay tuned. Yeah.